Good morning, Shabbat Shalom to all here and all who are watching via Facebook and YouTube. This is a very special Shabbat. It is called Shabbat Shuva. It is the Shabbat that falls before Yom Kippur every year and it is our last chance to repent and return. And our Haftorah actually calls out for Israel, return O Israel. And this is where this Sabbath that we read those words got, gets its name from scripture in Hosea. Return, O Israel, God calls us, because on Rosh Hashanah, our name is inscribed in the Book of Life, but it's not sealed for a good year ahead until Yom Kippur. So we want to make sure that if there is any unknown sins that we are atoned for, and that we have asked forgiveness, and that we have repented, and that we've come before the throne room with a heart seeking to be in right relationship with Him. And this is the last Sabbath to do that. So it's a very special Sabbath called Shabbat Shuvah. And in Zechariah 1.3, it says, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But you know what? They didn't hear, and they didn't heed me, says the Lord. So he's calling us in this as this last generation. Don't be like your forefathers. Everybody has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have sinned too. But the difference is, when you hear that call to repent and return, will you heed it? Will you prostrate yourself before the Lord in repentance? Will you have a heart that feels grieved for any sin that has caused a separation between us and the Father, as Isaiah 59 2 says, thy sins have made a separation between you and your God. And we don't want that separation, and God doesn't want that separation. As a loving Father, He wants to gather His children that have been scattered to the four corners of the earth back to Himself. But there's a process of holiness that must take place because light cannot coexist with darkness. So it's in love that He gave His Torah, His instructions in how to be made holy through manifesting his selfless love and that's what Torah is all about and sin is the transgression of that law of love and so as we're returning what are we returning to the law of love and that's why we say we're returning to Torah we can't return to God without returning to Torah first Shabbat Shuva refers to the Shabbat that is during the what's called the days of awe. Ten days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur are these days of awe where we are feeling the close presence of the Lord and we know that we need to have our sins atoned for. It was at this very time that Moses was finishing up his last of three journeys to the top of Sinai, each one 40 days from the time that Moses had first gone up and then came back down to find the children of Israel had built a golden calf and then he needed to go up and seek atonement for them and he came back down with further instructions after another 40 days so now he's been up there 80 days fasting with no food and water and then God calls him back up again and he's interceding for Israel and at the end of 120 days guess what it's the tenth of Tishri. It's Yom Kippur. And God gives him this promise that I will atone for the children of Israel. And so he comes back to our forefathers with good news. God will atone for you. And it's these days of awe that Israel was really on their face. They were pleading. Imagine knowing that Moses is interceding for them, but Moses can't do anything for them if they're going to continue in their rebellion and their hardness of heart. So they're all on their face around Sinai and they're repenting just as we are repenting. We are following the pattern that our forefathers established 3,500 years ago. And this only happens once a year. And this Sabbath is named after the first word of the Haftorah found in Hosea 14, verse 1, that says, Return, O Israel. And on this Shabbat, we actually read three Haftorahs. One is in Hosea calling us to return, and then one is from Micah, which is the origin of the Tashlik service, where God says, I'm going to cast your sins into the depths of the sea. This is when we cast symbolically our sins into the sea, 
in commemoration that God will atone for us, that he will remove our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. They will not be remembered anymore. So this is an encouraging Haftorah. And then Joel 2, it's kind of like the climactic promise that whatever we have lost due to sin, God's going to restore it. And this is that famous quote where Joel the prophet says, the Lord will return to you the years the locust has eaten. Whatever's been lost due to your waywardness, your rebellion, your sin, your living out of harmony with the principles of love, it's going to be restored. As you return back, those things will be returned to you. And that's where the blessing lies. Shuv is the Hebrew root of Teshuvah. Everybody say Teshuvah. Shuv means to return. So in the very heart of the word for repentance, Teshuvah, is Shuv, which means return. So there is no true repentance without returning. People can say they're sorry all they want, all day long, till they're blue in the face. But it, you know if they mean it, right? God knows if we mean it. Our actions show it. This is why it says that the Lord will come with his reward with them to recompense everyone according to their faith? No, according to their works. Because faith is made manifest by our works. True repentance is going to lead us back to Torah observance and showing us how to love God and how to love our fellow man. And so we must return. And it's a time for us to repent. As Yeshua said, repent in Matthew 4, 17. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We are the final generation. And if it was at hand in his day, imagine how much more it's at hand in our day. It is so close. And we need to start living by the eternal principles here and now. Many people in Christianity think that they're going to be changed by force in the twinkling of an eye at the coming of Messiah. But that is not what the scripture says. Yes, we will be changed from corruptible to incorruptible and from mortality to immortality, but it's not by force. Now is the schoolroom for our character development. And now is the time to repent and to, to prepare our hearts to receive the bridegroom as a bride without spot or blemish. It will not be that we are forcefully cleansed in the day of the Lord. This is why the Lord calls out to us early. Repent, O Israel. Come back to me. Don't be like your forefathers. Acts 3.19, the same message was given by Peter after Shavuot in Jerusalem. Everyone was unified and the Spirit of God had descended upon them and they were speaking in many different languages, telling this amazing message of God's plan of salvation and what God had done through Yeshua as the prophet like unto Moshe and the spotless Lamb of God who came to seek out the lost house of Israel and take away the sins of the world. And what was part of Peter's message in Acts 3.19? Repent and return. Exactly, he was playing off of the word of Teshuvah. So that your sins may be wiped out in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and he may send the Messiah. So then after Yeshua had ascended, they're still looking forward to the Messiah coming. Isn't that amazing? They were saying, we want the Messiah to come, just as we say as Jews, may it come speedily and in our day. But what was his message to help Messiah come? God's people need to repent and return the whole house of Israel so that our sins will be wiped away and the times of refreshing that God intends for us will come and then he can send Messiah. So if we understand this verse correctly, that means that Messiah is not going to come until there's a remnant of Israel who has repented and returned. Of course, we know that not everyone will repent and return and that's why it's called a remnant in prophetic scripture. That means a few leftovers of of all the tribes of Israel who in the last days are keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Yeshua as John saw in vision. Here's the word in Hebrew. You've got the Tav, Shin, Vav, Beit, and He, Teshuvah. Now, in the picture language, any of you that have taken my Hebrew class, you'll find that the Tav, especially in Paleo-Hebrew, it was a sign of a covenant. It always represents like Torah and the covenant that God made with our forefathers at Sinai. 
shuv is these three letters here. All Hebrew roots of each word are always three letters. Once in a while you'll see a two root Hebrew, um, but most of the time it's a three Hebrew letter root. And then he at the end is kind of a suffix that always represents something to reveal. There's something to behold. There's something to be seen. So when Abram became Abraham, God added a he to his name. It means there's something deeper in his character. Now he's not just an exalted father. He's a father of many nations and God is going to bless him with through Isaac. And so the he was added. Sarai became Sarah. The he was added to her name because now she's become a princess of Yah and there's a beautiful characteristic for all women to follow in Sarah. Well likewise in this word shuv you've got a prefix and you've got a suffix. So if we were to just break it down in the Hebrew language the word for repentance teshuvah is the covenant to covenant and then to return and then to see. So if somebody's really repenting to covenant, they're going to return and everybody will see it made manifest in their life. Or another way to look at it is covenant, return, seen. Are you at a place in your life that you want to repent? Do you want to return to the covenant? Do you want the blessings that were lost to be restored? Do you want to be found without spot or blemish when Messiah comes? then we need to experience teshuvah and return to the covenant. In Greek, this word is called matanoia. Matanoia, though, like all Greek words, doesn't quite encapsulate the depth and beauty of what the Hebrew was meaning to convey. Matanoia means to have a change of mind. So if I'm going this way and I say, oh, this is the wrong way, I might change and go this way. Or I might do a complete 180 degree turn but does that mean it's the right way? I can turn in any number of different ways, but unless I'm returning to the source, it's just another lost path. It's just another wrong turn. Teshuva means to return to the source, to return to covenant. Matanoia, yes, we need to have a change of mind, but that change of mind needs to be to return to God and to His ways. No matter what it means in my life, no matter how inconvenient it is, so we want to experience true teshuva. Matanoia is not a bad word. It just doesn't fully encapsulate how the source is so important because many people repent of their sins, but then they don't know where to turn to stop sinning. They don't don't know that Torah is the source of, like 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is the transgression of the Torah. So in the New Testament, it's actually defined what sin is. We want to return to the source so that we're not transgressing it any longer. In Zechariah 1, in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, so this is during the Persian Empire, they've just delivered the Jews from Babylon, and Zechariah receives a word from the Lord. And the Lord tells him to tell the people of Israel, the Lord has been displeased with your fathers. Therefore, say thou to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return unto you. Be not as your fathers, to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Return ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor did they attend to me, says the Lord. So in this text that we read, there's actually a hidden promise. Isn't it beautiful to think that as we return to the Lord, His Spirit will return to us? Now, we all have His Spirit. No one is devoid of His Spirit. But how much more would you like to have His Spirit living in you and through you so that you can shine the light of His love in all that you do? You will see your words becoming more powerful. You'll see your prayers becoming more powerful. When His Spirit truly has returned to you, you will be able to speak things into existence and pronounce healings even as Yeshua did. And so he says, return to me and I will return to you. This is a great promise. Micah 3.7 says something very similar. I always like to show a double witness in the scriptures because God confirms a matter by the witness of two. 
through Micah, he says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from mine ordinances and not kept them. So here he's clarifying. It's all about his ordinances, those commandments that he gave at Sinai. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Almost verbatim of what Zechariah's message was. Beautiful. There was a great rabbi named Moses Ibn Ezra, and he said, No sin is so light that it may be overlooked in our lives. No sin is so heavy that it may not be repented of. Today, we want to meditate on addressing the little things in our life. Some of the things that we've shoved under the carpet, some of the woundings that are causing us to hold on to bitterness or pain or unforgiveness. If it's possible to gain control over something, then now's the time to do it. If we need to ask forgiveness of someone or reconcile a relationship, let's not wait. Because our relationship with God is a direct correlation of our relationship with each other. And this is why the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is likened to, to it. Love your fellow man as yourself. Now, our Haftorah is found in Hosea 14, where we get this term Shabbat Shuva from, because we read this each year before Yom Kippur, that says, Return, O Israel, unto the Lord thy God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. So when we come to the Lord, what words do we take with us? words of repentance, words of Father, I'm sorry, please cleanse me. Like David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Actually, we'll be reciting together today some of David's prayers for repentance. And this is exactly what this scripture is talking about. Coming to the Lord with words means with a heart of repentance, praying. And it even tells us what to say to him. So we're coming to the Lord on this day of return, and we say, Father, forgive us of all iniquity, and accept that which is good from us, so that we will render for bullocks the offering of our lips. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we call any more the work of our hands our gods. For in thee the fatherless finds mercy. It's relating his character. He's so good, even though he's the judge of the universe, we don't have to be afraid to go before him, even with our iniquity. This is what this is relating. We can go and we can seek his forgiveness, and we don't have to be afraid of being rejected. I will heal their backsliding, the Lord says. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away. I will be as the dew to Israel. You know, when you want something to grow and prosper, you water it. This is what this is relating to in prophetic imagery. The children of Israel will blossom as the lily blossoms, so beautifully and fragrant, and cast forth its deep roots like the cedar of Lebanon. This means Israel is going to be well-grounded and strong. And he says, his branches will spread, and Israel has spread over the four corners of the earth into every nation. And his beauty, when he returns to the Lord, Israel's beauty is going to be as the olive tree. That's our prophetic purpose and destiny. You know, in scripture, Israel was always referred to as the olive tree because its fruit is very delicious. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations, and its oil is what gives light in the menorah, and Israel is to be a light. So we're to be fragrant, and we're to be a light to the nations, a very apt description of Israel, and his fragrance as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall again make corn to grow and shall blossom as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim will say, what have I to do any more with idols? As for me, I respond and I look on him. I am like a leafy cypress tree and from me their fruit is found. So it's in him that in him dwelling in us that we bear much fruit. And this is what it means to have the fruits of the spirit. When his spirit resides in you, what is all your mannerisms going to be like? Love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and it doesn't mean just when it's convenient. This means even in the worst of times, you're going to be the best version of yourself because His Spirit is flowing through you. The self has died, the lower self. You've died to self. You're a new creature in Him. Ephraim, it's interesting, just like Dan led the children of Israel in the lands of their migration, but unfortunately he led them also into idolatry. And so here Ephraim is saying, what do I have to do with idols anymore? All those other gods and all those other substitutes and all that other wrong theology, I don't want it anymore. I want to return to the source. Beautiful description because Israel used to be called Ephraim. It was like a synonymous term for the whole house of Israel and especially the ten tribes in their migration. So really what it's saying is all of Israel that is dispersed will finally do away with their false theology and doctrines and return to Torah. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is prudent, let him know. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just do walk in them. Does this fit with the law being nailed to the cross? If the ways of the Lord are right, and if God doesn't change, He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then do you think that He established something that was not good enough, that was a failure? Oh, Israel can't keep it, so let's do away with it and just let them continue to sin and cover their sin. Is that the gospel message? Or is it return to God's ways, their blessings and their life, as Moses said, on the verge of Israel entering the promised land. And we are Israel on the verge of entering the promised land. And it's time once again to remind Israel, I ch set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose life. Walk in Torah. The blessings will be restored to you. The land will not spit you out. You will be fragrant and you will be strong and you will be healthy and all your relationships will be restored and all your prosperity that was lost will be restored. And we'll actually see that in the third part of the Hoff Torah that God promises to restore to us all the years the locust has eaten. In this one verse, or this one passage of nine verses, we see so many promises. If we return, we will find mercy. Remember where it said that? He says in verse 3, the fatherless find mercy. If we return, we will be healed. If we return, we will be loved. If we return, we will be blessed. If we return and repent, we will be beautified and made strong and healthy and prosperous. This is good news. Who wouldn't want to repent? Now instead of repentance seeming like a negative thing that we have to shrink from, we can run into the Father's arms knowing what's in store for us. Blessings and mercies and healings and love and beauty and strength and prosperity. This is awesome. We've been our own worst enemy. Going wayward from God has caused our own curse, which is the loss of blessings. It's time to return. It is said in the Midrash, Tehillim, on um, the Psalms, that when the house of Israel appear before divine judgment, the angels will say to them, don't be afraid. The judge is your father. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Imagine children trembling. Oh, I know I'm unworthy. I know I'm wretched, wretched man that I am. I know I've sinned. And you don't even want to go up for judgment. You're just so afraid. And the angels encourage you. Don't worry. This is your father. The judge is your father. I think that's such a beautiful premise that's passed down to us. In approaching wrongdoing and repentance, do we feel as well as believe that God is as intimate and forgiving with you as a loving father, as, he, as a father would be to his child? Can you fully embrace and be embraced by God's care? This is something I want you to practice this week as you go through the final days of repentance. Rabbi Shul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 3. We have nothing to fear when we go before the Father of love with a heart full of repentance. He welcomes his children. When in prophecy is this great awakening and return to God's Torah prophesied to happen? Hosea 3, verse 4 and 5, actually says that it's going to happen in the end of the age. This is our time, the time that precedes right up to Messiah's coming. 
It says, For the children of Israel will sit solitary many days without a king. How many days have we been without a king? Long time. You know, it's about 950 BC that Solomon handed his throne over to his sons and the kingdom was divided because they raised the taxes. Ephraim, the northern kingdom, has never liked taxation without representation. <laughs> and so we've always rebelled against taxation. We did at the time of Solomon's sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and we did again at the time of King George. We have never liked heavy taxation and oppression. And so we have been without a king for a long time and without a prince. If you think back how long that has been, that is almost 3,000 years this is talking about. Even though the prophecies were given, he's basically telling you it's going to be a long time until Israel really returns, until they really repent. They will be without a king and a prince and without sacrifice. This means that the temple would be destroyed. And yet this message was given when there was a temple. So amazing prophecy here. They'll be without sacrifice and without pillar, even without a priest, because it talks about the ephod and the teraphim. Afterwards, after all of that, after the kingdom being divided and us being scattered amongst the nations and not having a king any longer, not even having an identity any longer, not having a temple and a priesthood to lead us any longer, the children of Israel after that will return. That sounds a lot like our day. And they will seek the Lord their God and David their king, speaking of Mashiach bin David. And they shall come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the end of days. This is exciting. This is the time for us to return. Isaiah 10, 21 and 22 says, The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sands of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. And the cons consumption, that's kind of like all the bad stuff that's happened to us. Consumption used to be another way of saying you're diseased. And we have been diseased through sin. You know, there's so much that we've lost. It's kind of like saying all the effects, the cause and effects of your sin shall be turned to righteousness. And what's beautiful is that there was a prophecy that Israel would have to be, have to leave the land. And that if they did not repent after 390 years, remember Ezekiel lied on his side 390 days to tell Israel how long they would be out of the land. Leviticus 26.20 20 says that if they do not repent and return then, their punishment will be seven times more over. Well, seven times 390 from the time that Assyria took them from the land equals 2,730 years, which brings us to the Great Awakening of 2009, when people have woken up to wanting to return in repentance. They're leaving the churches by the droves and returning to Torah. And they're saying, we don't know why. We don't think we're Jewish, but we're hungering. They had no idea they were at the lost house of Israel. And what's beautiful is we can share with them as they're repenting and returning to Torah who they are and why they're returning to Torah, why their DNA is waking up and they're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because it was prophesied that they would return in the last days. That after everything was lost, God's people would return because God would restore his covenant with them that he had made with our forefathers. And this is happening in our day. This is what we're experiencing. The remnant is beginning to return. And the cause and effect of our actions and our waywardness is beginning to be turned into righteousness. God will have a righteous bride when Messiah comes. This is what Rabbi Shaul was speaking of when he said, Israel has experienced a hardening in part. Do you know for 2,730 years, our eyes were blinded. Our hearts were hardened. We lived like Gentiles in Gentile lands. We ate unclean foods. We went and worshiped on wrong days. We followed false gods. And Paul says, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number in the nations has come in. What he was referring to is the Melogoyim that Jacob prophesied over the house of Israel through Ephraim. And he said, 
you will become, and it gets translated, a multitude of nations, meaning that they would be in every nation kindred in tongue. But more true to translation would be you will fill up. A mellow means a full measure. So we have a mellow of wheat in our omer. That means you're going to totally fill up the nations. You're going to permeate every aspect of life. Israel is going to be everywhere and they're not even going to know it. When they have permeated every aspect of an area, area of the nations, then God will wake them up return the curse into a blessing, restore them to Torah, and it's through that return to covenant and that Torah observance that Israel can then be a light to the nations because they're already scattered amongst all the nations. So though the people of Israel will be as the sands of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. Paul says, in this way, all Israel will be saved. Isn't that beautiful? This is Romans 11:26. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Jacob is another way of saying Israel less than perfect. <laughs> Remember, Jacob's name was changed into Israel. Jacob means the hand that grabs the heel. He's trying to supplant somebody else to pull himself up. Or like Esau coming out of the womb and holding on to his ankle. It kind of means that you're pulling yourself up at somebody else's expense. Not a perfect name, but Israel means Prince of God or upright. Yashar El is the upright of Elohim. And so when Paul is referring to and prophecy refers to Israel less than perfect, it often refers to Jacob. Jacob, the whole house of Israel in Jacob. When it refers to what God intends for the whole house of Israel, it refers to them as Israel. Very beautiful. Moses, on the banks of the Jordan, gave one last discourse to the people, and he reminded of the people of God's goodness and his deliverance from Egypt, and how God made covenant with them at Sinai and how they sinned and so their forefathers were not able to go into the promised land but this younger generation they would be able to go into the promised land and it's very much like us today our forefathers were not it wasn't in their generation that Messiah came and returned the exiles of Israel back to the land but it's in our day and in our generation and as he sums up he reminds them of Torah and he basically Devarim which is the Hebrew word for Deuteronomy gets translated into Deuteronomy means second law because Moshe sums up all the words again of the Torah to remind Israel, don't deviate from them. When you go into the land, be sure to keep them, otherwise it will spew you out. Well, he gives this beautiful Torah blessing. And he says, and thou shall return and hearken to the voice of the Lord. And that's what I'm saying to you today. Let's return and hearken to the voice of the Lord. And let's do all his commandments which I command you this day. See, he had just summed up the whole of the Torah, so he could say that. They knew what he was talking about. Do all the commandments which I reminded you today, and the Lord thy God will make you overabundant. How would you like that? To have a blessing of overabundance in all the work of your hands, in all the fruit of your body, and even in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your land, everything will be for good for the Lord will return joy to you for good as he has had joy over your fathers if you will hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God now he lists them out to keep his commandments in case there's any question how do we return to the Lord keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of the Torah. If you will turn unto the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul, you will be blessed. You will be returned to the land and you will be restored to covenant with him. Now the second part of the Hoth Torah, normally in the synagogues we only read Hosea and Micah and Joel. And we read it in Hebrew. So if you don't understand Hebrew, you miss a lot. What I'm doing is telling you the meaning of why we read these half Torahs, and I'm incorporating other scriptures in between them to show you that all of the scripture is speaking the same message, and it's beautiful and it's cohesive. The second part of the half Torah is Micah 7:18, that reminds us 
of how good our God is, how his love and compassion is steadfast. It says, who is a God like unto thee, O Lord, that pardons the iniquity and passes by the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? So what is God's heritage? What is his inheritance? The pe that's right, you, the people of Israel. What's our inheritance? The land. So he is actually talking about passing by the remnant of his people, all their transgressions that they've committed because they have experienced true teshuva and they have returned to his Torah. He retains not his anger forever because he delights in what? Mercy. Hallelujah. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. What a beautiful promise. This is the origin of our Tashlik service where we symbolically cast our different sins. As we ask for forgiveness, we're throwing these different sins representing different aspects of flawed character and thinking away from us. We want it to be gone, so we usually do it in living water or deep water. He says he will subdue our iniquities. That means your propensity to want... You ever do something wrong and then you ask for repentance and then you end up doing it again and you feel like, oh, I hate that. Why have I fallen again? Well, what's beautiful, this word subdue, it means that he's going to make it so that you don't have that propensity any longer. If you repent and you're sincere, he will take away that desire from you. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou will show faithfulness to Jacob. Here it is again. Mercy to Abraham as thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Now, in this last verse here, he shows faithfulness to Jacob representing the whole house of Israel. But why, it, I think it's so beautiful, he included that he's going to show mercy to Abraham. Do you know who this is for? This is for all the Ishmaelites. This is for the Arabs to have a promise to return and repent and to come back to the Lord. There's nobody that's exempt from coming back and being the seed of Abraham and being grafted into the family of Israel. And so there's beautiful grace added to the house of Jacob in saying that he's also going to show mercy to Abraham. Remember, it's not just talking about the person. It's prophetically talking about their descendants down through the ages. This is good news. He will show faithfulness to Jacob, the whole house of Israel, and mercy to all the seed of Abraham, as thou hast sworn to, unto our fathers from the days of old. Repentance is a change of mind and heart. It includes turning away from sin and turning to God for forgiveness. And that leads us to Joel, the last part of the Hoff Torah that we read each Shabbat Shuvah. Around the world this morning, they're reading these same passages. And it's like we have this amazing energy by corporately meditating on the same scriptures. I only wish that most rabbis brought out the depth and beauty of what is all incorporated here in these passages because it's so prophetic and pertinent to our day and to who we are as his people. Joel 2, 15 says, Blow the horn in Zion. Sanctify the fast. So now that we have sought repentance and we've returned and we've been promised that he will restore us, it now is, the prophetic focus is on Yom Kippur. Now it's time to blow the shofar. The only fast day, the only feast that is a fast day or the only holy day that's a fast day is Yom Kippur in a few days from now. It's saying that we can now announce it and call a solemn assembly. Gather the people and sanctify the congregation. What's the word sanctify mean? <coughs> to be set apart, to be made holy. We are made holy by being set apart from the world so it fits. 
So we are setting apart Yom Kippur as a holy day. We don't do any work on it and we don't eat on it. And we afflict our souls in case there's anything that we have missed during the whole month of Elul, the month of repentance, leading up the 40 days to Yom Kippur. Is there any aspect or any sin that is hidden or I'm blind to? We are really seeking to be sanctified in mind, body, and spirit and made holy. He says, gather the people and sanctify them. So we're sanctifying the day and we're sanctifying the people. We're assembling the elders and gathering the children and even the infants. And it says then prophetically as to that future day when Messiah comes and he receives his bride on Yom Teruah and there's a time of intimacy in the hupa, then it's announced on Yom Kippur in that future year, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her hoopah. Now it gets translated as pavilion in English and you miss the whole beautiful meaning, but a hoopah is a marriage chamber. It's saying that the marriage is going to be happening at this time of the year between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur in the future when Messiah comes. And it's on Yom Kippur that the bride comes out. And Kippur actually comes from the word kafar in the Hebrew, which means to veil. But see, the bride is going to come out of the hoopah after those seven days of intimacy and lift the veil. The veil will be lifted and she will know her God even as she is known. And there will be this amazing knowing on Yom Kippur. Just as we are fully exposed when we come before the throne room, Yom Kippur is a time of judgment, but it's also going to be a time of the wedding. And it is also a time when the king is coronated, and it is a time of the year of Jubilee being announced. All these things have always happened throughout history in Israel to point forward to the day of the Lord and what would be happening during the fall feast after that. Joel goes on, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. This is like our last chance to repent. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach. So we shouldn't only be praying for ourselves, seeking to be saved. You know, in, in some ways, if you're only looking out for yourself, then there's a little self-centered focus there. True repentance will also have the intercessory mind of the high priest, praying for our brothers and sisters, all the children of Israel, everyone in the family, and so we should be prostrating ourselves, weeping between the porch and the altar, asking God to spare his people, the whole house of Israel. Give not thy heritage to reproach, that the nation should make them a byword. Wherefore they should say amongst the people, where is their God? I've heard stories about him delivering them from Egypt, but now look at, imagine in the last days how it's going to look. Where's their God now when so much is happening against them? So this is the mindset that we need to have as intercessors as we get closer to the end. Then was the Lord jealous for his land and had pity on his people. And the Lord answered and said unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you will be satisfied therewith. And I will no longer make you a reproach amongst the nations. Even now we're scattered, and many of us don't have the blessings that the Lord intends for us to have. But imagine in that day when the nations will look and see how he has regathered us back to the land and restored the blessings. He promises, he says, I will remove far off from you the northern one. Who was the northern one? That was Assyria who came and took us captive into exile. What it means is no longer will we be dispersed and no longer will we be captive to anyone. We will be totally free in the land of covenant. And I will drive him into a land barren and desolate. That's talking about all of our enemies prophetically with his face toward the eastern sea and his hinder part towards the western sea, that his foulness may come up and his ill savor may come because he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. This is a prophetic foreshadowing of him returning us to the land and doing away with our enemies. Be not afraid, beast of the field, for... 
The pastures of the wilderness do spring forth, and the tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad there, and can't you just kind of see in mental imagery the land of Israel, which has been so barren for so many thousands of years, now springing forth and budding and being restored just as the people are being restored. Be glad then, children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he gives you the former rain in just measure and causes to come down for you the rain and the former rain and the latter rain as the first. And the floors will be full of corn and the vats will be full of wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years the locust has eaten. Locust is symbolic of anything due to our waywardness and the waywardness of our forefathers, anything that has been taken from us, any loss of blessings, any suffering, any trial and tribulation, any loss in relationship, it's going to be restored. God desires to restore this. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palm worm, all of these are different symbols of different things that steal, kill, and destroy the joy and the blessings from our life. But God allowed it to bring us to repentance. He allowed us to be dispersed amongst the nations. He allowed us to experience the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. Why? Because he disciplines those whom he loves. Because if he didn't discipline us, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua HaMashiach. And so he allows us to experience the cause and effect of our sins so that we, through our own free choice, come back to him naturally. And we realize this is not what I want. I realized the blessings I had with him, and then I went wayward and I lost the blessings. Hmm, let me, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out where do I go to get the blessings back, just like the prodigal son. That is the whole story of the house of Israel going wayward and coming back. And the older brother is Judah, who's been holding on to the inheritance, which is the land. And he's not too sure about the younger brother, whether his intentions are pure when he comes back and whether what to do and that's why the story is left with him not saying much but this is the whole story of our people the lost house of Israel your parents they've gone astray but their children you and me coming back and God will restore to us the years the locust has eaten this is a promise that you can claim in your prayer life it's beautiful. Father, restore to me the years the locust has eaten. He wants to do it. He's promised he will do it. What is he waiting for? For you to repent and return. And you will eat plenty and be satisfied and shall praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never, ever be ashamed again. Hallelujah. This is good news. And you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. You know, just like Bilaam looking down and wanting to curse Israel, but he couldn't curse them because God was in the midst of him. And he says, how beautiful are your tents, O Jacob, and your tabernacle, your dwelling places. A blessing came forth. Ma tovu, o halelaka, Yaakov, he said. God is going to be in the midst of Israel once again, and everyone will know that He is the Lord, our God, and there is no other God, and my people will never be ashamed. He promises again. There's the double witness. So what does it mean to repent? To make inward acknowledgement of my sin? You have to face your obstacles, your shortcomings. You can't just shove it under the carpet. To be truly heartbroken over it to feel, you know, we should rather die than to commit any known sin. It's one thing if we make mistakes, but we shouldn't commit known sin. And this is why the sacrifices were always for sins of ignorance in the past. It wasn't for open rebellion. We should be heartbroken over our self-seeking, over our lack of selfless love in our life, over our Torahlessness, and ashamed of what it's caused us to do. We should make open confession both to God and to each other if we've wronged one another. This is why I think it's 1 John 1 9 that says if you confess your sins he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I should have had that text up on the board that's perfect for today's study. We need to make open confession to one another. Don't be afraid of not being accepted or being rejected. You will be set free in that confession. 
and we need to make restitution. It's not good enough to just say, I'm sorry. If I've taken anything from you, if I've hurt you, I need to make restitution for it. I need to seek reconciliation with others. Anything that's caused division, anything that has hurt a relationship, I need to resolve firmly not to do it again also. Like we said earlier, don't just repent and then go fall back into sin once again, especially the same sin. Let's not duplicate it once it's revealed to us. We need to ask divine aid in avoiding repeating it and beg God's forgiveness. And then to realize the beautiful freedom as that burden is lifted. you know how much sin burdens your soul? People are walking heavy and downtrodden in the world because they don't know where to turn. They don't know how good our daddy is, that he will receive them with open arms. So they're carrying this burden. When you ask for forgiveness and you confess your sins and you make restitution and you return to the source, what a burden is lifted and removed. Repentance is to know the comfort of God's pardon and the sweetness of His atonement. Amen? To be tempted to repeat the same sin is one thing, but God will help us overcome. And repentance is to find it more difficult now to sin than not to sin. Isn't that the place that we want to get to, where it's more difficult to be errant and to transgress his Torah of love? It would be more difficult to act selfishly or unkindly than to have love, joy, peace, and patience in our life and every aspect of our life, no matter what somebody does to us. You know, there's an old saying that a man is only as good as he is in his worst hour. What good is it if you're happy-go-lucky and loving when things are good, but when people do you wrong, can you still show the love and peace and transcend what they've done to you? That's what he's willing to give you through his spirit. Let's stand in closing and repeat David's words in Psalms 51, 1 through 12. And say together, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee alone, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightst be justified when you speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice once again. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for showing us your loving kindness. It is your love that woos us back into right relationship with you, that calls us to repentance and makes us want to return naturally. And so, Father, we repent today individually and corporately and ask for you to take away all of our sins as far as the east is from the west. Cleanse us, O oh God. Create a clean spirit within us and renew a right spirit and totally make us holy and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We love you and we thank you for this Shabbat Shuva that we can more deeply meditate upon how we need to return to you and how we need to make amends for our sins and how we need to restore broken relationships and repent from all wrongdoing, Father. 
we love you, we thank you, and we rejoice in you, and we look forward to your Yom Kippur, this day that you, signifies how you atone for us and how you seal our name in the book of life for a good year ahead. And so this is my prayer for all of us here and for all of those listening and for the whole house of Israel scattered throughout the nations, Father. Write their name in the book of life and seal it for a good year ahead. This is our prayer. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.